As I mentioned in a previous video, the UK is proud of its coastline, but as well as use it for tourism, the public were also conscious of the fact that a beach is a perfect landing spot for invaders and it needed protecting. The UK at the turn of the century had the most formidable and strongest naval fleets going, but the public still wanted coastal protection in case war ever broke out. They weren't alone. Across Europe, money were being pumped by each nation to bolster their coastline borders. The UK though, with so much coastline to look after, didn't just want static defences. They wanted to be able to move their defences around to where they were required. Many ideas were put to the table, with the majority involving the largest and heaviest machines that could move hundreds of tonnes at a time, the railways. The ideas of moving artillery on the railway went as far back as 1847, when inventor James Caleb Anderson proposed mounting 32 pounder guns on iron ordnance railway trucks, but the idea was initially dismissed as too costly and impractical. If one clever man wanted to, he could simply blow up the track with some well-placed dynamite, rendering the train useless. So the consensus was to bolster ports and points of weakness with better static fortifications. But the idea of a railway artillery train simply wouldn't go away, and nearly 50 years after the first idea was proposed, the first Sussex Artillery Volunteers and the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway joined together to produce the first mounted railway gun carriage. It was made using a 20-ton flatbed and a standard field gun with its wheels removed. The gun was mounted to the flatbed and a steel shroud surrounded the gun, designed to protect the crew. It was crude and clumsy, but it really worked. It could swivel easily on a turntable mounted between the flatbed and the gun and locked in place when used, so it was quite nimble. The gun's ammo and the soldier's private quarters were made by modifying standard rolling stock and was kept separate from the gun in case of mishap. While great in principle, the train was extremely heavy and had to be pushed rather than pulled, causing some grumbles from the drivers, especially considering the cargo. Overall, while successful, it was concluded that the gun was surplus to requirements considering the power and the might of the Navy. Little did people know back then that the railway gun would come into its own just 20 years later. It was the outbreak of the First World War. Horses and tractors were commonplace, pulling heavy guns into position on the front, but the horses' hooves and the heavy wagons would churn up the roads and the guns on both sides were getting bigger. As the troops dug into the trenches, railways that were once used to bring food and supplies were now being strengthened to bring bigger guns that the horses couldn't manage. They were usually kept at the rear of the forces and were used to bombard and pulverise the enemy trenches supply stores and aid to cut off any enemy assembly points and enemy rails. These were known as the howitzers. An average 12 inch howitzer could take on shelves about 6 foot long and the force of it firing would send the entire gun 15 yards backwards down the line. The guns were cumbersome and took time to move and only specialised units were trained in using them. Unlike other guns closer to the front, the rate of fire was painfully slow and they were difficult to maintain. The gun's weight also had a habit of breaking the rails. The railway guns received very little credibility and their lack of overall performance outweighed any usefulness that they had, but the guns did show some promise. After the war, it was theorised that due to advancements in mobilisation technology, that trench warfare was becoming less and less of a tactic. The Army Council concluded that no future railgun be developed, however the money used for the guns to be put into better anti-aircraft and anti-tank weapons. While no new designs were put to the table, the existing stock of railguns were modified and remounted. The Mark III and V Owlitzers were in active service right up until the 1940s, and the Mark XIII's and IX's were a common sight. The guns, however, shone in the Second World War. By the time war had been declared, the British Expeditionary Force and the 52nd Super Heavy Regiment had gone to France with a mass of heavy artillery guns, many mounted on railway trucks. It's not known how many there were, but it, when they returned, 54 heavy guns were missing, but the War Office had claimed that about 900 weapons had disappeared.
It wasn't a complete loss as the majority of the stock was old World War I vintage and considered outdated, but it did leave a gap in the defences which would take months to fill. Prime Minister Winston Churchill was not taking any chances and insisted that more heavy guns be taken to Dover to bolster its defence. Up north in Catterick, soldiers were being trained on guns mounted to railway stock. Larger 9.2 and 13 inch guns were being brought in from naval stock to be rolled into position in weak points around the coast, ready at a moment's notice to fire on enemy ships. The railway works in Darlington was commissioned to make in these guns and gave the guns names using old World War I nameplates. Consequently, Scene Shifter, Gladiator and Peacemaker were just some of the names given to the weapons. But the biggest by far was Bruce. Bruce was a 13 and a half inch barrel, experimental, hyper-velocity railgun that could launch a 256 pound shell over 62 miles. To give you an idea of how far that was, not only would Bruce be able to launch a shell clear over the English Channel, it could easily launch it over the town of Calais and still have mileage to spare. It was unclear just how many railguns were situated along the south coast, but generally the majority of the heavies were generally noted as a railway gun. Lugging these monsters around the coast was of course left to the railway men and women that worked the lines for years. The government tried to overcomplicate the situation by issuing instructional manuals with mathematical formulas on how to move the guns with the most efficiency. Most of those ended up in the bin, with one half of drivers saying that the workings didn't take into practical line working and variables, and the other half telling the government to stop sticking their noses in it and let them do their jobs. In the end, the drivers simply got on with the task at hand. They tried different locos on different weights and had a good understanding of what worked best with what weight and what gun. One book conscripted and military drivers had to abide by was the Military Railway Rule Book. The majority of the rules were carried over and railway workers conscripted from their civilian work would have been familiar with the majority of the terms. Other rules included handling and moving of heavy rail guns, especially around turns, and the rules about keeping the engine steam so they can be used any time, and mainly night travel being as inconspicuous as possible were also included. After the war, and following advancements in air military, the railguns were eventually rendered obsolete. The majority were headed for the cutter's torch with only a few relics overseas that were kept for preservation. As for Bruce, he was decommissioned having fallen silent in 1944. It was established that the barrel was worn and he was scrapped. Due to advancements in warfare, it's unlikely we will ever see the likes of railway guns like the Owlitzers again. Surface to air missiles, rocket launchers and precise bombing targeting systems have taken over the role of the railgun. It's much more precise, leading to less civilian casualty and accidental friendly fire. But while they were a small part of the war, their strength, power and sheer awe did leave a lasting legacy.